adapting demand to supply for high renewable penetration. Now, I've uh, given uh, several versions of this uh, talk, and typically the context has been in uh, grid-based uh, 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 systems, but I will try to talk a little bit about where I think these ideas connect to microgrids. I do think they connect to microgrids, and particularly, I think they connect uh, to uh, the title of uh, this uh, event, Microgrid and Opportunity, Electric Vehicles and Renewable Energy Resources. So I'm gonna speak both to renewables very specifically, and then uh, occasionally to uh, electric vehicles. Um, I'm not sure how big the audience is, but I think from just looking at the screen that it's not terribly huge. So if anybody has any questions or, or comments, uh, you know, by all means, you could uh, uh, interject or we could just uh, chat at the end. Uh, in any case, without any uh, further uh, ado, um, I want to uh, briefly outline uh, a little bit of a caricature about traditional planning and operation of the electricity system. And what I want to highlight from that is a somewhat unusual characteristic with electricity when we compare it to other industries, particularly other commodities, um, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that as we go along, um, that will bring us to <clears throat> thinking about the supply side. And when we think about the supply side, I want to talk about the concept of a fuel endowment. But when we start, start to speak about renewables, I want to introduce a concept, and it's kind of an obvious concept, so I don't mean it to be uh, particularly original to me, but I think it's helpful in organizing how we think of our traditional approach to meeting demand versus how we might need to think about this in a high renewable world. So this concept is a temporal fuel endowment, basically how uh, renewables are distributed over time. And uh, to get to the punchline, I'll then um, want to speak to how in order to get to deep, deep carbonization through high levels of renewables, we really need to think about adapting to those temporal endowments. Now, some of you may already be, you know, uh, find this uh, terribly obvious, uh, but I think a lot of people certainly in um, uh, uh, OECD countries, for example, are, are uh, some, somewhat, this idea is somewhat new to them. So first, let me uh, give a little caricature of traditional planning and operation of electricity. Uh, I'll phrase it around grid scale planning, that is to say when you have a transmission network, generators, distribution network, and, and consumers, but many of the concepts really apply slightly differently to, to microgrids. But fundamentally, if I want to uh, meet some demand, I need to forecast it. And I particularly need to forecast the peak demand in order to understand how much capacity I need. And that might be based on economic trends. It might be based on major new consumers. Uh, for example, uh, a new residential subdivision, a new factory, let's say. And at least conceptually, we uh, get out in front of that forecast by building the generation capacity to meet the peak, and then somehow we procure the fuels to provide the energy to uh, power the prime movers for that, for that generation. And um, that dependence is mostly one way. In other words, our forecast historically has been a forecast of the, of the, of the peak demand without necessarily any modulation based on uh, price, let's say. Uh, and the peak demand then implies the generation capacity that we need, at least if we're going to meet all of that demand. And the energy and the distribution of energy implies the fuel needs. Of course, all electricity systems have some version, or most electricity systems have some version of trying to moderate the peak. Uh, uh, and there are different versions of that. Uh, uh, for example, a demand response pro, uh, program might be one example. I know that historically, at least, uh, 
uh, in India and perhaps many other Southeast Asia and other uh, Asian and Southeast Asian countries, there's been involuntary curtailment at the time of the peak. In other words, uh, uh, rolling blackouts at various times. Um, but to the point, whatever the demand is, we either have enough capacity to meet it or we don't. And I'd say there are similar issues, although I phrase this around grid scale planning. Uh, really, this is similar issues for microgrid planning. You need to forecast the electric demand, particularly the peak. You need to have some sort of generation resource, uh, distributed, distributed resource, let's say, uh, to meet the peak and procure the fuels to provide the energy. And again, the peak demand implies the generation capacity. So that's uh, somewhat of a caricature, but it's, it's in brief the way we might plan the system. And I, and I want to emphasize that it's really a one way, mostly one way dependence. In other words, we forecast the peak, accept what it is, and then build if possible to meet that peak. And at least in the context of restructured electricity markets, and I know that electricity markets around the world, uh, well, electricity systems around the world uh, vary uh, from traditional uh, regulation to state owned en enterprises to what's become common in uh, the United States, Australia, and, and, and many other OECD countries, which is uh, electricity markets. Um, and so given the context of electricity markets, that mostly one-way dependence, uh, I observe, is a little bit surprising. Why is it surprising? It's surprising because electricity is uh, by far the most volatile of all commodities. And the reason for that uh, volatility is because of the lack of cheap storage. Uh, when we think of storage, whether that be pump storage, hydro, whether that be chemical batteries, they're not anywhere near as cheap as an oil can or an oil tank, or even a gas well that's being used for storage. So cheap, uh, there's a lack of cheap storage, and we also have relatively inflexible timing of demand. Um, and as an extreme version of that, until recently, until the recent uh, uh, case with uh, gas or oil futures, electricity was the only commodity that exhibited negative prices. And that's a particularly extreme form of price volatility and negative prices are very specifically driven by the fact that we don't have cheap storage. If we had cheap storage, we certainly wouldn't be paying someone to take energy away, to take electricity away, we'd be storing it. So, so that extreme volatility, even to the point of negative prices, is uh, uh, very much part and parcel of the lack of cheap storage and, and inflexible timing of, of demand. So um, I don't want to completely belabor this, but it is a very important and essential part of electricity. And to just highlight wh why I'm, I am harping on this to some extent is that in essentially all other commodities, the demand level, the timing of the demand would be modulated by supply conditions and the resulting prices that we see from those uh, supply conditions. And so if I work, walk into a market and, I'm in, and I'd like to buy some bananas, but they're expensive, I might buy more apples if they're relatively cheaper. Uh, I might fill, fill my petrol tank during the week to avoid weekend prices. And so we could say there's a coupling of the demand side to the supply uh, through, through prices, uh, a modulation and a changing of the timing of demand that is affected through uh, prices in the, the commodities and retail goods that we purchase. But electricity demand has historically been different, and there are a number of reasons for this. Um, there are uh, relatively few substitutes for electricity, at least historically. Uh, these days we might see more uh, substitutes. Um, and so because the there's very other, there's very few other alternatives, and the electricity provides a service which typically is quite valuable to to us as consumers. The demand tends to be inelastic, and furthermore, uh, the timing rel is relatively inflexible. Um, 
I'm not going to uh, wash my clothes, put them in a, a clothes washer at 3 a.m., no matter how cheap electricity is at that time. And I'm not interested in using uh, a reading light in the middle of the day, right? So um, uh, we have relatively inflexible timing with many of the things that we use electricity to do. And um, I'll mention this again in a couple of slides. Historically, there was very little flowing through of the supply demand conditions into prices. So as well as demand being inelastic, there were very few price signals to uh, inform consumers when supply was tight or supply was plentiful. So very, li very little coupling of the demand side to the supply to electricity prices. So even though I mentioned that wholesale prices are very volatile, and if you look at any of the markets in the US or Europe or, or uh, Australia, for example, you'll see that even on a daily basis, prices fluctuate quite, uh, quite significantly, uh, but most retail customers don't see that. And so there's very little responsiveness of the demand side to the supply to electricity prices. Well, I've made this point that we have little coupling. Um, so uh, what's the big deal? Does it really matter? Well, to answer that question, why care about demand side coupling? Let me now add into the mix something that's changing our historical situation. And that is renewables. Renewables result in greater variation of what I'll call net load, that is to say the load minus the photovoltaics, minus the wind, minus the run of the river hydro production, greater variation in the net load compared to the variation in the load. And of course, in every electricity system that is integrating renewables, uh, we, we find that the residual or remaining thermal generation system is needing to uh, follow the net load instead of the load that historically prior to renewables, significant amounts of renewables, uh, the thermal generation would just follow the load to the extent it was capable of doing so. Now we've got net load that we're exposed to, which has greater variation typically because the renewal, renewables are not uh, well correlated with the uh, demand side. In fact, in many cases, they are very poorly correlated. Um, and so what has happened in many regions is that the thermal generation is, is insufficiently flexible to cope with that variability. Um, and as a general rule, we would observe that coal and nuclear tend to be less flexible than gas. Gas is usually more flexible than coal or nuclear. And so we might expect that a rational adaptation to greater variability in what the, generate, the thermal generation needs to provide would be a move to uh, more natural gas fire generation, at least in the short term. Well, uh, against that issue, uh, we have gas supply limitations in various regions. Uh, regions that have to import natural gas certainly have gas supply limitations, uh, but even parts of the United States where there's a lot of gas domestically produced have gas supply limitations. So uh, bottom line is renewables tend to result in greater variation in the net load than the variation in the load. And as I've alluded, that tends to pose challenges for uh, large scale grids. But I'll point out that it also poses challenges that says post challenges, but it should have been post challenges, excuse me. Uh, it also poses challenges for both uh, grids, for not only grids, I should say, but also for uh, microgrids. And in fact, we might say that it poses even more challenges for microgrids than for normal grids, because microgrids are likely to have uh, even uh, smaller uh, uh, thermal resources or maybe even very little thermal resource at all that might have quite limited ability to ramp up and down. Um, <clears throat> so to sort of pull that together, 
if I had enough flexible generation, let's say thermal generation, and it didn't have fuel limitations, and we didn't care about carbon, about carbon dioxide emissions, then we really would be in a not very different world to the world that we were in previously. We'd still build to meet the peak and procure fuel. If we had renewables, uh, we would be meeting what you might call the peak of the net load as opposed to the peak of the load, although the peak of the net load will typically be nearly as big as the peak of the load. We'd still procure fuel to uh, provide for what, uh, for the net load that is uh, not being provided by the renewables. And um, we really wouldn't care so much, or we would still continue to not care so much about the coupling of the demand side to the available supply. So if we had enough flexible generation, if we, we didn't have fuel limitations, if we didn't care about carbon dioxide, uh, but we just decided to add some renewables because they had become relatively cheap, we'd still basically have the same planning as always. We'd still uh, have limited coupling of uh, supply demand, supply conditions to resulting but actually what's happening is the renewables by increasing the variability of net load and because in many many countries i'm sad to say australia is not uh pulling its weight on this um uh, emissions goals are forcing the consideration of demand side coupling so we're really getting into a situation i believe and not everybody agrees with me uh where uh, we're going to have to pay much more attention to coupling demand to available supply, okay? And, and again, to, to encapsulate that, except through involuntary curtailment, the demand side is not usually exposed to changing supply side conditions. And that's manifested in several ways. For example, most retail customers still see, in, in even in countries that have got, in regions that have restructured their markets, most retail customers still see flat rates that don't vary with tight uh, supply or don't vary with supply conditions. There's also typically volumetric adders to the wholesale energy price that are used to recover the cost of transmission and distribution. So, that status quo uh, discourages people from caring about uh, supply conditions, discourages them from caring about when the renewables are not producing and we need some other resource. And it's my position, and I'd like to, to make this point strongly in this, in this presentation, that we need to start thinking about better coupling of the demand side to the available supply. And that's perhaps the key point for the balance of this, pre of this uh, uh, discussion. And to explain that a little bit, um, I, I just want to uh, mention the concept of fuel endowment. Nothing uh, earth shattering here. Uh, all I mean is what uh, fuels were available to uh, a particular region. So historically, at least, fuel endowment uh, significantly guides generation choices. Let me give some um, specific and, and idiosyncratic examples. Uh, Texas uh, historically used coal, gas, and nuclear. Uh, more recently, fracking has increased, increased gas supply and therefore increased the contribution of gas. But on the other hand, the terrain is very flat, uh, as Rajiv will uh, 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 attest. Uh, Texas is pretty flat, not much hydro, uh, so we don't have any hydro resources. On the other hand, Australia is historically predominantly coal with some hydro, more recently some gas, again, because of gas uh, resources. And then different countries, their generation resources have reflected uh, largely what they had available, at least initially, and then supplemented by imports. So the fuel endowment is what you have available. It's not always literally that. We can import energy, import re fuel resources, but typically because that involves foreign exchange, the, the first resource that's tapped is the one that's local. And if we uh, look at, at how we've used fossil and nuclear fuels and reservoir hydro for that matter, the stored energy in fossil and nuclear fuels and in reservoir hydro has allowed us relatively unfettered temporal distribution of consumption given enough generation capacity. Because we had all that energy 
stored in fossil fuels, in nuclear fuels, in gravitational potential energy, in the hydro, uh, because we had the, that storage relatively cheaply as fuels, we could do what we like in terms of consumption. And again, let me emphasize that that is changing. That's changing to the extent that we're moving to uh, uh, intermittent or variable renewables because we're no longer tapping a stored energy resource. We're tapping a resource that is due to a flow of energy, which therefore has a temporal time varying character. And it's precisely because of this time varying character that I believe we need to consider coupling the consumption decisions to time varying production through demand response. Now, a couple of slides ago, I said that not everybody agrees with me about uh, thinking about uh, coupling uh, demand decisions to supply. And the typical uh, thought is, well, what about storage? Why don't we just use storage, particularly batteries? And I'll observe that current uses of utility scale chemical battery storage in, in uh, US and Australia is typically to provide so-called ancillary services in particular markets, which are relatively short-lived, uh, low ener total energy uh, um, products, or in smoothing uh, partly smoothing short-term fluctuations in renewable production. Um, and so if someone is proposing to use batteries as uh, the way to avoid the, the demand side having to do any, any uh, adaptation, if someone's proposing large-scale battery storage, uh, let's see whether that sounds practical. So near-term um, projections of what battery costs will come down to are about $100 per kilowatt hour of capacity. Uh, and if we assume, let's just a, just a, a round number, let's say 3,000 round trip cycles over the life, that would be 10 years. Maybe you can get 15 years out of it. Uh, but if you only got uh, uh, 10 years out of it, uh, and even if we ignore financing costs, these days interest rates are pretty low, if we just do a simple division of the round trip cycles into the capacity, a round trip battery charge and discharge in terms of the consumption of the lifetime of the battery costs around $30 per megawatt hour energy stored. If you imagine you're gonna get 15 years of life, then that would be closer to 4,500 round trip cycles, maybe 5,000 round trip cycles, and you might get down to $20 per megawatt hour of energy stored. And I don't know whether uh, uh, many of you are familiar with typical prices in electricity markets, but $30 a megawatt hour is about the same as the average ele uh, Electric Reliability Council of Texas or ERCOT, that covers most of Texas, the typical ERCOT wholesale price. So the uh, problem is, that if you're going to spend $30 per megawatt hour to store energy, and it costs you $30 per megawatt hour to make the energy, then you've just basically doubled the cost of the energy by storing it. So I'd observe to you that storing most energy in batteries is gonna significantly increase overall grid costs, and is probably not a near-term solution to dealing with the fluctuations of net load. Of course, uh, costs of chemical batteries are going down, but the bottom line, or I would claim the bottom line and a principal point of disagreement between me and people who boost batteries is that they are currently far too expensive to fully support grid scale deep decarbonization. Um, nevertheless, there are some demonstration examples that I think uh, show some promise. There's a thing called the Tesla virtual power plant. I think that demonstrates a role for storing some energy in chemical batteries, but that is uh, uh, currently uh, uh, dependent on subsidies where it's been deployed. I don't think it's a uh, it can stand on its own economic merits. On the other hand, if we turn to microgrids where the cost of energy is likely to be significantly more than the cost of grid scale energy, uh, the economics may be more favorable. And moreover, 
at least some storage is likely to be cost effective simply because the engineering solution that I'm proposing of demand following supply is not going to get you 100% of the ability to follow uh, demand, uh, to follow uh, renewable fluctuations. I think we'll need some additional buffer. Uh, so I think storage is likely to be uh, cost effective. Some storage is likely to be cost effective in microgrids. But I think the, the key observation I'd like to make is it's not the only solution. And uh, again, what I'm uh, going to try to argue in, in the rest of this presentation is that it, it's, it's not the only solution. Chemical batteries are definitely not the only solution that demand side response is a significant part of the solution. So why, why, are they, why is the challenge? It's because the variability of the wind and solar uh, provides challenges to the residual system. And indeed, uh, the mismatch between PV production, for example, and electric load is especially significant for certain regions. California is a great example. And indeed, I suspect many of you have heard of the California duck curve. Uh, and I suppose no presentation uh, about renewable fluctuations is complete without a, a, duck a duck curve slide. So I'll be presenting one in a moment. But um, for those of you who are not so familiar with it, the idea is that on a mild sunny day, the net load, the California load minus renewables falls so low that the other, the remaining thermal generation cannot follow it down and then cannot follow it back up as the net load rises very rapidly in the evening as the sun goes down. So here's a picture of it. This was actually a uh, graph made quite a few years ago now, and I, my understanding is that uh, on occasions on spring, some spring days, the situation is even worse than seen here. Uh, but to explain it, the, the top curve here is what the 2012 uh, typical consumption on a particular uh, uh, spring, northern hemisphere spring day would be when you add solar, and solar is typically going to peak at the middle of the solar day, and March 31 is already uh, after daylight savings begins in most North American states. And consequently, the peak of the solar day is at 1 p.m., and so what you can see is that uh, increasing solar illustrated each successive year bites away at that mid-day uh, consumption, at that uh, consumption at the solar noon to the point where there's a, a very significant dip, whereas historically there would have been a peak. Now that's not the only bad thing. The other bad thing is that when the sun goes down, we see that the net load rapidly increases. So over these few years, we're also seeing slow load growth in California. They may not have realized some of that load growth, but even if they didn't realize that load growth, the slope of the net load uh, you can see is getting sharper and sharper. So they need a very large amount of fast re ramping resources to become um, able to, to, to match that change in net load. This sort of curve, the duck curve, is becoming problematic in other grids where there's considerable uh, solar, particularly where there's considerable uncontrolled rooftop solar. And in fact, in certain places, Australia is an example, uh, the grid operator now requires that it can curtail rooftop solar uh, so that it can forestall uh, very low net load conditions. Well, uh, microgrids, of course, are a little different, but if you have solar power in your microgrid and you have a typical load shape that might not peak in the middle of the day, or even if it does peak in the middle of the day, the hump of the solar might be so large that just like the California duck curve, the net load ends up having a larger fluctuation than it would have uh, in the absence of uh, solar production. In other words, this sort of issue, I think, is also an issue in microgrids. 
So going back to that notion of the energy endowment, different regions historically adapted by using their energy endowments. And I would say similarly, what we need to do uh, with increasing renewables is pay attention to the temporal endowment, when the renewable resource during the day is most available. And I think that needs to be uh, effectuated by economically coupling the consumption more strongly to renewable supply through demand response, preferably voluntary demand response. And by the way, I'd certainly like to avoid involuntary curtailment by focusing uh, the flexibility onto consumers that are able to provide that flexibility, F focusing on the reduction in co consumption onto the most uh, flexible consumers. And uh, this is not new to me, of course. Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, for example, refers to this as shaping and shifting demand. Uh, but let's see uh, how that might work out. Uh, first of all, we need to notice that wind and solar have different temporal endowments. So wind um, inland in several regions is typically strongest at night. And it's also typically strongest in the autumn, the winter, and the spring, and may not be so strong in the summer. This, of course, depends on the particular region. On the other hand, near shore wind, and by that I mean both wind that is offshore but near to the coast and wind that is onshore and near to the coast, it's uh, the wind velocities are typically strongest in the afternoon, particularly in the summer because of uh, sea breezes. Uh, similarly, during monsoon times, you'd certainly expect winds to be uh, uh, strong uh, around shores and anywhere the monsoon was, was heading. On the other hand, solar coincides obviously with the solar day, uh, but is modulated by cloud cover. So we've got two different uh, types of renewables with two different types of regimes for their temporal endowment. So, and I put it to you that increased renewable penetration really needs to confront and it needs to adapt to that temporal endowment. So what are some of the adaptations? And I will spend the rest of, of this uh, presentation discussing some of those adaptations. First thing is in the, to the extent that we're doing grid, grid scale type uh, uh, developments, where we can interconnect with transmission renewables from various regions, we might consider building uh, the shares of inland and near shore wind and solar capacity to better match the typical load shape, particularly in the peak season. Uh, we might need to add some more agile thermal capacity, uh, predominantly gas if it's available. We might need to add some storage and we might even need to spill some renewables. In other words, we to the extent that the renewables, particularly the solar, is getting to be extremely cheap, at least the panels, we might want to oversize our panels, for example, compared to our power electronics, so that we can, over more fluctuating solar resource, maintain a higher average capacity factor. So these are grid supply side adaptations. The spilling of the renewables also is certainly a microgrid, microgrid um, a solution. Storage also and more agile thermal is also a microgrid, potential microgrid solution, but clearly building uh, transmission to connect different uh, renewable regimes is something that's going to be uh, not so uh, available to a microgrid. If we turn to demand side and behind the meter type uh, adaptations, uh, what we can, might expect to see is more variability in retail tariffs and exposure of retail customers to, to wholesale prices. Largely speaking, that has not occurred a lot amongst residential customers, uh, even in re retail restructured regions. It's happened to, to a large extent for commercial and industrial, and it has indeed uh, resulted in some price-based demand response. Uh, I think Going forward, there's also a lot of potential for more active demand side modulation through retailer customer agreements, and they might involve such features as uh, controlling air conditioning or controlling uh, heating. Uh, but the, the uh, example that I want to emphasize that I think is also more relevant uh, 
to is also relevant to microgrids is the end use storage of a product or service. And I want to view that as an adaptation to a temporal endowment. Uh, and this can particularly take advantage of new or growing uses of electricity that have not already become uh, kind of set in concrete in terms of how the consumption pattern has formed. And um, uh, again, let me emphasize that end use storage is uh, applicable, uh, sorry about another typo there, that should say applicable to both grid and microgrid applications. So starting with the low hanging fruit, the low effort end use storage, uh, a great example is off peak water heating. So to the extent that one has a storage heater, uh, you can uh, utilize excess energy uh, that is that might otherwise be uh, uh, thrown away um, by uh, heating up uh, hot water in an insulated tank. Uh, so that's uh, a, a very simple application. Uh, another story, and this relates to the uh, topic of the of the conference, uh, electric vehicle charging. Uh, if we control or time the electric vehicle charging, and particularly if we're able to modulate that charging so that it's slower than uh, uh, typical, um, we can potentially uh, charge it at night in regions with inland wind. On the other hand, we might want to charge it during the day for regions with high solar. And what we might want to do is when the sun is just getting up, we might not want to charge at a very rapid rate at all. And then as the sun, uh, as the solar production increases, during the morning through to the middle of the solar day, we might want to increase the charging rate and then taper it off again as the solar goes down. So the nice feature there is by at least some of the time charging more slowly than the full rated capability of charging, we might be able to uh, undo some of that net load fluctuation by uh, adapting our electric vehicle charging. Another option, this may not be so relevant to India uh, uh, because of the housing stock, but something that makes sense in regions that have uh, highly insulated, uh, well insulated buildings and that use air conditioning is to, uh, and also uh, a subject to, to uh, hot uh, afternoons, is uh, air conditioning pre-cooling, where we can better align the daily demand variation with the solar production. So the idea here, just like uh, uh, storing energy in the car battery is storing an end use product or service, we can imagine storing the cool in a building uh, uh, by uh, cooling the house perhaps uh, earlier than we might normally do so. So um, uh, let me uh, speak in a little bit more detail of that, uh, uh, those two topics, electric vehicle charging first and then uh, AC pre-cooling. Uh, in ERCOT, in Texas, it happens to be that the inland wind peaks at the middle of the night. And so that's an ideal time for at-home charging of electric vehicles. Uh, if you had a microgrid with a, a wind turbine on it, it might be uh, a super time, uh, if it's windiest at night, to do a little bit of electric vehicle charging at night, uh, particularly if the charging is spread out over many hours uh, during the night between when you get home, let's say, and don't need your car, and when you leave in the morning. There's often a lot of flexibility to restore the charge, particularly for daily uh, driving cycles. And so by not uh, charging it immediately when, when you arrive home, but rather setting it up to charge opportunistically when the wind is blowing, uh, that may be a, a really nice way to uh, counteract some of the effects of renewables on increasing net load variability. If we have a, a grid or a microgrid for that matter that has a lot of photovoltaic production, we might, um, on the other hand, want to utilize that uh, at the time of solar noon. In other words, uh, that speaks to electric vehicle charging during the day, but certainly completed well before sundown. And both ideas, uh, for wind to the extent that it uh, uh, blows at night, uh, stronger than during the day, and uh, electric uh, photovoltaics to, to the extent that as always, that there's more solar production during the day than the night, we just might wanna align our charging 
with those uh, productions. In other words, that's aligning the consumption to the temporal endowment. Well, uh, we might also want to think about electric vehicle discharging. Um, and that previous application that I described used EV charging as a flexible demand. In other words, we, we didn't want to get the energy back out into the electricity system. We wanted to get the energy back out to drive the car. But of course, various people have suggested using electric vehicle battery capacity as storage. In other words, both charging it and discharging it. So let me first observe that I don't think this is a very good idea for daily fluctuations. And the reason why I don't think it's a very good idea for daily fluctuations is because it's likely to uh, affect uh, warranties on car batteries. It's likely to affect the lifetime of the car battery. So that may not be a very attractive thing to do. But um, to the extent that we've got a microgrid that is usually connected to the grid, usually can rely on grid electricity, but occasionally when there's an outage has to disconnect from the grid, uh, electric vehicle battery capacity might be a very useful um, uh, resource for those uh, times. So if that's every day, then maybe this is not such a good idea, but if it's once a month or a few times a year, in other words, if we're talking about a occasional charge, uh, discharging of the electric vehicle battery, that's likely to be cost effective as a backup while the grid is disconnected. I know there are many researchers that have started to explore that. Uh, several years ago, um, uh, several students of mine uh, explored it. And what we found was that the sheer size of typical electric vehicle batteries is so large that it can be an absolutely fantastic resource for backing up a household. Again, let me emphasize that that's not something that I would advocate on a day-by-day -day basis, but as part of a microgrid under the circumstances of occasional disconnection of the microgrid from the main grid, I think this has a lot to be said and is likely to be one of the most cost-effective ways for microgrids to add storage. So definitely something where there's a beautiful synergy then between electric vehicles and uh, microgrids. Turning to uh, uh, AC pre-cooling, um, uh, in addition to emerging loads such as uh, electric vehicle charging, we could think about other ways to better utilize photovoltaic production. Uh, and um, let me observe that typical electricity net load peaks are in the morning and the evening during winter and in the late afternoon to the evening in summer. So focusing on the summer on a, on a, on a hot uh, climate uh, where we have air conditioning, we might want to think about pre-cooling. What do I mean by pre-cooling? I mean, uh, dropping the temperature of the house down to uh, a slightly cooler temperature in the middle of the day, perhaps when there's nobody occupying it, or perhaps when there are people occupying it, but dropping it down to a lower temperature than they would normally uh, have during the day, uh, and then slowly allowing the temperature to rise back up to the desired set point uh, later in the day. Now, I've been warned by uh, a couple of colleagues that this might not fit very well, with, uh, let's say, typical current uh, Indian housing stock because it doesn't tend to be uh, insulated and it also tends to be designed to allow for ventilation for when there's a, an evening breeze. Uh, so this uh, may not be such a, a great example for, uh, uh, for folks uh, listening specifically to, the, to this presentation, but I think AC pre-cooling in AC heavy regions such as uh, Texas and the southern United States um, is, is definitely a, a possibility. And the idea being that, um, in fact, it's become such a significant load in the southern United States and in Australia that it's a significant contribution to the peak of net load. Um, and it continues to be a contribution to the peak of net load after the sun goes down. In other words, after the time when the solar is no longer going to be helping. So indeed, for example, in Texas, residential consumption in summer greatly exceeds that in spring and autumn, and it's driven almost entirely by air conditioning load 
during times of high temperatures, and these times of high temperatures persist into the evenings and definitely after sundown. In other words, solar production is not going to be available at those times. So that net load ramp that the California uh, ISO was experiencing in its duck curve uh, was uh, is, is, is made even worse. So the idea here is to cool the house during the peak of the solar irradiance. Uh, and if there's enough insulation in the house, if there's enough thermal mass in the house, we could uh, imagine that the cool stays there. Of course, some of it will leak, so to speak. Heat will come back into the house. But if there's a good enough uh, insulation and if there is uh, enough thermal mass, what we'll see is that the cool will persist and that will reduce the electric load in the evening after the sun goes down. So in a... Uh, a situation where I have a household with solar that's connected to the distribution system, it would uh, reduce the exports from the rooftop solar to the ele electric distribution system. It would reduce the ramp rate of the net load and re reduce the peak of the net load. Um, that's true for a grid connected house with solar. Uh, I observe that it's also true for a microgrid that was supplying air conditioning load. That might not be so common uh, in the Indian context, but uh, one thing I'm sure of is that the 21st century will see huge increases in the amount of air conditioning uh, throughout a lot of the, the, the world. Uh, it will uh, grow very rapidly as uh, consumers become uh, modestly uh, wealthy. So uh, I think this is a, a growing issue for decarbonization uh, worldwide. And I observe to you that pre-cooling is, is, a, is a potentially part of the solution. Uh, alongside, admittedly, perhaps improving the thermal behavior of uh, housing stock. So uh, it's not... Uh, a panacea, it's not an unalloyed good. In, in particular, pre-cooling ends up resulting in higher overall energy consumption by maybe two to 8% overall. And this is somehow analogous to round trip losses in a battery storage system, uh, roughly the same magnitude. Uh, the, the positive is that besides perhaps a bit of insulation, no capital uh, purchase is particularly necessary for pre-cooling. Let's uh, see schematically a little bit how it would work. Uh, in this uh, particular uh, uh, graph, I have um, uh, the uh, data from uh, homes in Austin, prov kindly provided by uh, Pecan Street, which has uh, data uh, feeds from various homes. The blue curve uh, over uh, 96 quarter hour intervals in the day uh, shows uh, net load fluctuations. And what you can even see, so the horizontal axis is time in the day from midnight to midnight. The 96 uh, is counting quarter hour intervals. The vertical axis is showing uh, average net load of a collection of homes. So there were uh, 20 or so homes. They had air conditioning. They had uh, solar. The, ble the blue curve shows the net load. Uh, the average net load you can see fluctuates uh, uh, at about 1.5 kilowatts early uh, after midnight. Then it drops in the middle of the day. Why does it drop? It drops because of the solar rooftop solar production. And then it grows again quite rapidly. And, um, and it uh, peaks at, uh, on average, somewhere between three and three and a half kilowatts. Something to notice in those middle hours is that the net load has gone negative. So for these houses, they have so much solar on their roof that their net load has gone negative. This is uh, an issue in uh, Pecan Street. Uh, the, those houses, which are in a particular new development in Austin, it's also an issue in other solar-heavy regions of the world. Uh, uh, South Australia in Australia is an example of this, where uh, net load goes negative in residential uh, areas. So that's the blue curve. How could how could re uh, pre-cooling help? Well, I haven't, uh, in this graph, done a formal study, but some colleagues and I are working on some more formal studies on this. Uh, but conceptually, how it might work 
is by bringing forward some of the consumption to earlier in the day, to the middle of that solar day, we can increase the consumption during the middle of the day. So the red curve suggests how pre-cooling can help. What has happened is that I modeled that the uh, air conditioning load has been brought forward uh, by a couple of hours and increased. Um, and what that means is that in the middle of the day, uh, the uh, pre-cooling results in quite uh, significantly higher electricity consumption to the point where instead of having negative net load during the middle of the day, our net load is now positive uh, most of the day. There's still a couple of little fluctuations to negative. So that's advantage number one. We're not exporting energy. Uh, and in particular, we don't need to store it anywhere. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what you can see from the red curve is that the peak in the evening is lower. And if you look, if you connect from the middle of the day to the peak in the evening, which is uh, over on the right hand side, the slope of that net load ramp, the slope of the net load ramp has now decreased significantly compared to uh, the blue curve. So the red curve shows how pre-cooling can help. It reduces the net exports, which in a microgrid context, that translates to reduces the need to store the energy if we don't want to waste it. Uh, it also reduces the peak. That means I can size things smaller. And finally, uh, I also have a, slow, a smaller slope in my net load, which also means that my thermal resources or whatever is providing the difference between my uh, making up for my net load, providing for my net load, only has to ramp at a slower uh, rate. So um, there's 101 other examples of uh, the idea of end use storage. Let me just give you some examples of higher effort end use storage. Some of these I'm uh, involved with, with colleagues at the University of Texas. Um, some are, some not. Uh, uh, a good example that's used in various places is chillers and dedicated cool storage for air conditioning. This is particularly uh, valuable for districts, campuses, for example, uh, many campuses in the United States. University of Texas Austin is one example, has dedicated cool storage. Uh, their a, a, air conditioning load is very significant in the hotter months, and they have cool storage. In other words, they're producing cool in at times of the day that are uh, off peak, and then they utilize that cool to run the air conditioning. On the other hand, in a, in a cold climate where we had heating, we might have dedicated warm storage. So both of those are, are applied in a number of places. Turning to things now that are only just starting to get applied, and in particular something that I'm working on with a colleague, we can imagine chemical processes such as air separation, use a lot of electricity it turns out, um, uh, we could store the end product. What is an example of end products? Oxygen and nitrogen. Air separation uh, tends to produce oxygen, nitrogen, and then a few other gases such as argon. And we could store that end product. And by storing it, we can adapt the consumption of electricity to off-peak times. So there's a, now an interaction between what the value of the electricity is and how, how flexible that air separation process is. Um, we can imagine some other industrial demand response. A uh, good example is a data center, maybe not such a good example from a worldwide welfare perspective is Bitcoin miners, but in any case, anything with computing capabilities is able typically to modulate its processor speed and therefore modulate its electricity consumption. So we could imagine that a, that a uh, a, a data center could uh, speed up and slow down its clocks to uh, its its processor clocks to to increase and decrease its electrical consumption. Now it's presumably got some constraints on responding to uh, requests, but it may be able to modulate that a little bit over a day. Uh, more uh, exotic examples uh, of end use storage is electro electrolysis to produce hydrogen, and then uh, maybe even moving on to other uh, uh, end products uh, such as um, uh, ammonia is something that's been discussed as a uh, 
possible end use uh, product for storing energy. So um, there's even more radical uh, uh, things we can think about of demands following supply. Uh, for example, if uh, one was in a microgrid setup where one also uh, did not have town water and needed to pump water from a well, you could pump water uh, into a tank uh, only when uh, the solar was most available. In other words, you could store the gravitational potential energy, uh, <clears throat> store the electricity as gravitational potential energy, and then let the water flow out when it was needed. So in many cases, we have water tanks that are used to, uh, uh, you know, for us to pump water into that water tank. But instead of uh, doing the pumping uh, essentially on demand, we could uh, size the pump up a little bit and then pump when we have available electricity. So I think that's something that might be particularly interesting in microgrid uh, applications. Uh, and then we could think of many more other options where we deliberately change the consumption based on renewable production. Uh, so in particular, sort of more uh, uh, even stronger version of, of controlling the air conditioning would be to power mechanical loads from a variable frequency drive where the drive frequency is adapted to renewable production. And I think that's both applicable for water pumping, but also for air conditioning and other loads that have compressors and other mechanical loads that can be operated at variable speeds. And in many cases already are being built with variable speed drives that sort of automatically provides us with an op option at least to think about uh, the demand following supply. And the idea here is that we could partially or even fully replace the thermal generation as the swing resource. And I think that's applicable both to the grid to help with renewable integration, but I think it's particularly applicable to microgrids where if we truly want to become uh, a off grid and non fossil, we're going to need to figure out what is the swing resource that compensates for fluctuations in other net load. And I think some of these sort of applications are potential examples. So, with that, I would like to uh, conclude. Um, I'd like to make the point strongly that foreseeable levels of battery storage uh, will be insufficient to cost effectively fully support deep, deep decarbonization. They might be part of the solution, but I think we need more. In regions that have got pump storage hydro, that's for sure going to be used. And so particular regions of the world already have pump storage hydro, and they're going to use that, I believe, to more to help with renewable integration. But we still uh, face the, flat, the fact that very likely uh, limited deployments of chemical battery, the limited amount of pump storage hydro is not going to fully enable a, uh, adaptation uh, to the fully compensate for uh, net load. And that means we're going to need to go over and above that. And I believe adaptation to the temporal endowment of renewables using demand side adaptation to uh, effectively compensate for the variability of renewables is going to be an important pathway to deep decarbonization. And I've given several examples that utilize end use storage in order to uh, adapt to that temporal environment. Now, uh, no one thing is going to be the, the full solution, but I believe that this will, uh, this is an important going forward. Uh, demand response is going to be a very important part of uh, adapting to renewable fluctuations. So with that, um, I'm delighted to uh, uh, present at this uh, uh, conference, and I wonder if there have been any uh, questions. Let me uh, have a look to see if there's been any questions or chat. Uh, in fact, I think I'll, I'll, start, I'll uh, stop sharing at this moment uh, to see if maybe anybody has got any questions or comments. I would like to invite participants if they have any query or they want to uh, ask with the professor, please uh, they can unmute themselves and they can ask the question. Okay, meanwhile, I have one question, sir. 
world is moving towards the electrical vehicles and uh, this is the additional load uh, for the residential areas so is it that uh, you are considering it as a challenge or it could be the uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. plus point for the, uh, the residential areas like uh, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. we have planned mm -hmm. the distribution transformer for some specific load but mm -hmm. the now the load is different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think uh, first of all it, it varies from region to region and in regions that already have high levels of air conditioning texas is a good example mm -hmm. If you look at their distribution transformers, they're already their ratings are far above what you might imagine in non-air conditioning regions. So I think in a, in a region that already has made a transition to significant air conditioning, it's likely that level one charging is not going to be a big deal. Level char two charging might be a big deal. Okay. So first observation is it depends on the region. I fully agree with you that in a region that does not has not already uh, adapted to air conditioning, has not already installed a lot of air conditioning, that the likely typical feeder levels could be greatly affected by charging. And I think uh, it's precise. It's it's sort of analogously to my point about reducing net load fluctuations with controlled electric vehicle charging. Precisely the same argument applies to reducing the variability of the load on that distribution transformer by sensibly timing our uh, charging. Uh, so if you have a lot of rooftop solar in a particular place, then it makes sense to try to do charging nearby to that rooftop solar, preferably on the same side of the of the distribution wires as that distribution transformer, okay? If we can do that to the extent possible, then we're going to minimize the need for operating those transformers. I don't know if you've uh, uh, been uh, uh, listening to or watching the, the, uh, some of the discussion on Paraglobe, but there was a, an inquiry uh, in the last week about fast charging, and um, fast charging I think is is uh, desirable for people who need to make an, an occasional long distance uh, trip and want to be able to um, they want to be able to uh, charge while on the journey. But on a day by day basis, I think there's a lot more to be said from trying to adapt one's uh, charging uh, timing to uh, resources and to the extent that you have rooftop renewables hey that's a great opportunity to do uh, uh, charging during the day assuming that your vehicle is parked nearby to that uh, uh, solar resource right so that may not work so well if you drive your car to work right but um for example, a particular uh, factory or a particular place of business might have solar panels uh, built over the parking lot. So to the extent that those solar panels are there, then that's another opportunity to utilize that during the day. So I think there are various ways in which we could uh, think about better adapting electric vehicle charging to uh, uh, the, the temporal endowment of the solar resource. And you can do that in simple ways, I plug it in and get it started only when I think the sun is up. You can imagine transitioning to much more sophisticated algorithms where the charging is being actively controlled, maybe even in response to a, uh, 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 a wholesale price signal or some other signal. But even before you get sophisticated like that, it's simple enough to think about, let's just try and utilize the solar, particularly when it would otherwise be causing negative flows on that distribution transformer, which is a problem in itself, right? So yeah. by focusing that charging to that time, you're not only reducing the, the uh, peak flow on the transformer, but you're reducing that, that negative flow. So I think that there's, there's uh, you know, not, it's, it's not even rocket science, right? It's just how do we, how do we think mm -hmm. about uh, 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 relatively painlessly trying to adapt our consumption decisions to uh, the temporal endowment. Uh, 
Now, I think there was a comment, but I can't quite see it. Um, right. Where is it? Ananya, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah, could you read the question for the professor? Yeah. Please? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, one question has come up that how can we model the demand as it is varying in nature? Mm, 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 mm. So, um, if you look at of consumption, it tends to be um, uh, has a specific uh, diurnal shape uh, that is modulated by temperature, by weather, particularly in, in places with air conditioning. Before matching the random fluctuations of the demand, we should first of all look at its daily predictable uh, fluctuations, its diurnal periodic behavior. And if you uh, take uh, historical data, you can see very clear diurnal characteristics. They differ a little bit region to region. So a summer peaking air conditioning region such as Texas has a very clear summer late afternoon peak. Uh, a winter peaking region or the same region in winter might have a double peak morning and afternoon. So, depending on the region, there will be a, we could say, diurnal periodic component, and then superimposed upon that will be some randomness. You will find that that randomness for load, not for, not for renewables, but for load, um, is uh, often can be relatively painlessly mo well modeled by uh, a Gaussian, but but bear in mind, you need to do that to the, we could say, deseasonalized, daily deseasonalized load. So I'm not sure if I'm addressing the question, but first step is to look at the diurnal uh, predictable behavior and then uh, uh, subtract on any given day that average predictable behavior hour by hour from the hour by hour actual load and then model that deviation. And I'll observe that you will typically find that that has a relatively uh, simple distribution. Um, a more sophisticated version of this in a place that has air conditioning and heating would be to look at the uh, mean temperature in the day because that is often highly correlated with uh, the electricity consumption. And typically when it gets significantly hotter than a particular level, uh, the consumption will go up, and if and when when it gets particularly colder, uh, colder than a particular level, the consumption goes up, and so that would be an additional term or pair of terms in the in the diurnal model, and then finally that residual might be well modeled by a Gaussian. So I, I'm not I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but but uh, by the time you get down to the things that are well, well modeled by randomness, I think you'll find that Gaussians are probably fine. For, for wind, of course, that's not so uh, true because we have uh, very often uh, something like a Weibull or, or other uh, distribution of the fluctuations. Okay, I hope that was responsive to the question. I think I got a thumbs up there. Are there perhaps any other questions? And then, yeah, could you read the another question? Please? So there are no more questions in the chat box as of now. Mm, okay. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Roth. It's uh, been my yeah. pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and if yeah, anybody I, has any follow-up questions, please uh, you could send me an email. I, I'm not too hard to find, so uh, send me an email. I'd be more than happy to uh, follow up. Yeah. So uh, I would like to also mention the things uh, about the India. Uh, like we have the, as you have mentioned, the centralized building where we mm -hmm. can do the pre-cooling. Mm -hmm. So whatever the new buildings are coming in Indian university and even corporate offices, they are centralized. Mm -hmm. So this can be used over there. Mm -hmm. And even I have published two, three papers with the elsewhere in which uh, I have uh, used the Indian scenario in which uh, we have the like uh, grid connected or some remote areas where the grid is only available for few hours in a ah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. way. Uh, so in that condition, even I have considered the totally remote area where the grid is not available. 
and the mm-hmm. autonomous microgrid is there means solar system is there battery and uh, if we are going with the uh, without demand side management it's uh, required a large size of uh, battery because uh, there is the another problem with the battery the power losses during charging mm-hmm. and discharging that uh, degrades the efficiency of the system mm-hmm. so uh, that around save uh, around 30% of the cost of the system with the demand side management for autonomous uh, distribution uh, autonomous uh, microgrid system and uh, like uh, we have uh, designed like uh, if we don't have the uh, like centralized building so some uh, equipments I found which match with the Indian scenario, like we have the refrigerator in the houses. So mm-hmm. we can do the like high cooling during the mm-hmm. surplus mm-hmm. generation. And, yes, uh, yes. Uh, and the electric geyser to, to uh, make the, to hot the water that can be uh, remain for the next 24 hours. Sure, indeed, 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 indeed. So I think there are lots of lots of ways that we, in very low tech ways and in high tech ways, right, that we can yeah. adapt to that. Um, third one, third load I found in Indian, every house has their water pump. So that mm-hmm. can be run during the peak sunny hours. So mm-hmm. we are mm-hmm. storing the energy in the form of water in the water tank to supply our, our daily water supply. So in this way, I've got consider the things so so again this is a very straightforward way to adapt to uh, available supply it's probably something that you're already doing and i think as we go to higher levels of renewables we just have to think about how to how to, be, how to more systematically adapt some of those things uh, to to do a better job uh i'd really like to uh read your the papers that you've mentioned on uh, centralized implementation. So please, uh, if you want to yeah. share them with me, I'd love to read them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. And now uh, this is a uh, e-momento from our site. Uh, please accept it. Uh, sorry, what, what do I do? Uh, oh, thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And this is the appreciation certificate for you. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Sincere thanks. It's been a delight to uh, present and to see you again and to uh, 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 have some uh, respond to some questions and to present to everybody. So with that, uh, uh, I uh, bid everybody a good day and uh, goodbye. Thank Thank you you very much, sir. Thank you very much for enlightening us. My pleasure. Bye-bye.